Okay, welcome everyone to uh, the second Kai work meeting of 2022. We had a lot already in 2021. Um, please note that this meeting is recorded and uh, you can find the code of conduct online. I've already said before the recording started, the only ones that you will see on the recording are people that are speaking. That's the way we have it set up. So as long as you mute yourself, we would love, and you are in a position where we can see you, we would love to uh see you uh, so we know who's here We'd like to keep it informal today we have dr ishtiak ahmed from the university of toronto as a guest before i introduce him i will make a couple more general remarks um, in the kai work series we have weekly conversations with experts on various aspects of the future of work general chairs are andrew kuhn and or cheer and the conversations are hosted by the technical program chairs, which are Anna Cox, Sneha Kumar, Elena Mentes, and myself. We have a fantastic team of volunteers uh, that's helping us in all aspects of the series. And if you uh, want to see who they are and what other amazing things they do, go to www.kaiwork.org. Uh, on the website, you will also find a link to register if you register, we'll send you information about the talks and calendar invitations with links to the Zoom calls. So that's just convenient. You got that part covered. Um, the format of each session is that we have a, a, a conversation with our guests. So today is Chuck for about 30 minutes. And that includes your questions as an audience. Um, please write any questions that you have in the chat. Uh, Helena is here with me today and she will handle the Q&A. So she will monitor and she will find the logical order of the questions so that the earlier you, you get it in, uh, the higher you get on her priority list for the questions. Um, once the conversation is stopped, we'll, we'll stop the recording and we'll also have some time for more informal conversation. With that, enough talk about the organization. Let's move on to the introduction of our, our guest today. So we're honored to have Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed with us today. He's an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Toronto uh, with additional appointments at the School of Environment, the Schwarz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society and at the Massey College. Uh, Ishtiak's research focuses on the design intelligence around strengthening the voices of uh, marginalized communities around the world. And he has conducted ethnographic work and built technologies in many countries, including in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Iran, China, the US and Canada. And I've left out many other countries that I saw in your CV, but these are just a couple. Um, Ishchak holds his PhD, a master's degree from Cornell University and his bachelor's from the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. And I read on your website that you are still mentoring HCI students in Bangladesh which I think is really great that you, you stay in touch with your roots. Welcome, Ishtiak. Uh, today we are going to talk about design challenges and, and how the voices of marginalized communities around the world can be strengthened. And um, when we were uh, email exchanging uh, before the talk, uh, we, we were, uh, uh, I was looking at a work you did in, in Bangladesh where you studied uh, ride-sharing applications like Uber. Now, I'm very interested also in the driving domain, but you are looking at a very different perspective, so that was cool. Because um, in, in Canada or the US, the assumption is often that the rider of the car is also the owner, uh, and in the Netherlands, the same. Um, but this is very different in, in Bangladesh. So, so can you tell us a bit about what's it like? How's the app and the technology used there? Thanks, for the uh, for the question and for a nice introduction. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so first of all, like uh, Kai Work is a, is a great initiative, and thank you uh, all for for, for for organizing this. Uh, yeah, you asked a very important question. Um, uh, the Uber or the ride sharing applications, uh, they are kind of uh, coming in a series of all this uh, gig economy sort of uh, technology interventions that we have been seeing uh, around the world for the uh, last one decade, especially it's, uh, it's rising. And uh, oftentimes we see this, um, you know, like uh, uh, 
acting in a way that is um, in, in the global south that is quite different from the way it works in the in the western world um, i started a few of them and i have still been uh, starting on this for the last five or six years and how uber is uh, uber app is being used in bangladesh is one of our studies that we published from uh, recently. One thing that we found here uh, is notably different from uh, many places in, in the Western world is that uh, people who drive the car there uh, are not necessarily the owners of the car. And uh, uh, in Bangladesh's context, it's uh, often quite easy that people have their personal driver or chauffeur for driving their cars. So when these Uber applications came to the picture, uh, the owners of the car saw this as a, an opportunity for earning more. So we investigated this, uh, this case through our ethnographic studies in Bangladesh. We interviewed the drivers and the car owners. And what we found that they are coming up with uh, three different models. And in each of the models, you will find how the, the drivers were actually at those who were, you know, like paying the more or actually struggling with the system. So we found like three kind of like a contract models that the drivers uh, you know, is really going to with the car owners. So first one is this kind of like a monthly salary model, which basically builds on whatever the, the structure was there before. So the drivers are paid monthly and then, you know, like uh, before they would get some break, uh, you know, in between their daily work. Now the owners of the car, they are asking their drivers to use the Uber as for earning more in that break time. So they are not getting the break and whatever money they are uh, earning with this Uber app is going to their, uh, their the car owner's account. Sometimes they are splitting that. So sometimes the drivers are getting some peanuts, but most of the time it's like a, most of the money is going to the owner's pocket. So the owners are basically earning money without doing anything and uh, the, uh, the drivers are doing extra work. So the second kind of a, uh, you know, like a contract model that we found uh, in Bangladesh was what we call like income sharing model. Here, the idea is that uh, the, the drivers and, uh, and the car owners, they come to a contract that, you know, uh, uh, here you, you own the car and uh, yeah, I will drive the car. Whatever we earn, 50% will go to you, uh, you and 50% I'll take. So this model is um, uh, is also getting popular, uh, but it gets complicated when there is a question about maintenance and repair. If uh, you know that there is an accident, who is going to you know pay the cost and all of this, and then the owners are complaining that sometimes the uh, the you know like the drivers are taking rides and they are hiding them from uh, from the owner. So there is always this tension going on. The third kind of like a contract model that we found, we call them like a rental model. Here the drivers kind of like get more autonomy in the sense that they come to a contract to their car owners that they are going to give the owners a fixed amount of money every month as a rent. And then whatever they earn from the Uber by driving that car is, is, uh, is theirs. So, so in that model, the car owner is kind of like doing nothing. They and they're, they, you know, like no matter whether the car is uh, running or not, they are getting like you know like a, a fixed amount of money every month. So we explored how people's experiences are in each of these models, all these stakeholders, and uh, uh, you know there were questions around uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, because the car owners often want to make sure that the drivers are always taking the rides and then the drivers are concerned about their privacy. They are also complaining about the fact that they're not getting enough break. And sometimes the car owners are not sensitive enough. And uh, also uh, there is this like a, always like an ongoing tension going on uh, when there is an accident, uh, which is pretty common in Bangladesh and the insurance companies are not that much reputed for uh, for their you know like helping the uh, helping their car drivers uh, and so yeah the things are uh, complicated and the complaints that we are hearing here in Bangladesh and uh, uh, we haven't uh, heard them much here in in the western world yeah you know, it, it reminded me while I was reading it I was I was thinking of how as teachers how part of how good our teaching comes across is depending on all these other actors, right? Mm -hmm. But like a driver of a, of a Uber car, 
the eventual evaluation will be how was your driver but it also depends on the car and all these these other constraints so it's it's a very complicated structure and what i got from the paper but i i would like to know a bit more from you about is that in part it also uh the, the way that these constructions are because it's not a default uber model right but it it sort of fits with the culture of bangladesh or how how things are naturally already organized in society can you tell us a bit more like how that how 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 is this sort of typical for society structure or or conventions maybe that's a great question and uh, well, like first of all you you say the right thing so now for the drivers it's not only like how they are driving uh, because it, it it also depends a lot how the car is and also what we heard from some of the drivers that they they, they are telling us that they now uh, need to make happy more people than they used to, you know, like I have before, because now it's it's not enough to make your, you know, the owner of the car happy because you're as a shopper, you're driving their car, but now you also have to make happy all these people that you're, uh, that are your passengers. And if your rating is low and you are getting less rides and earning less, then, you know, like your, you know, the, the car owner is not happy either. And it's also, you know, like hurting your, your monthly income. Uh, so, uh, so this problem is, is is kind of like a mounting, and we have also seen cases where people, like a drivers, are leaving this Uber app, so they are not happy with with with, with Uber. So now, uh, where where are these things going wrong? As you were asking, like uh, uh, you know, like this the culture uh, of that community and whatever the system that was working there in in Bangladesh and any other countries in the global south, huh? You know, like why these technologies are not you know working the way it's working here. I'm not saying that it's working pretty well in the in, in US and in the Western world either. There are complaints here too, but the complaints are different here. And one of the things that we uh, we often talk about is that when the technology was designed, some of the assumptions that it held uh, did not actually match with the how, uh, you know, like uh, things are organized in that part of the world. And one notable thing here is this car ownership model. So um, for for many countries in the global south, car is still something that's, uh, that's also like a symbol of rich. And uh, you know, like uh, you own a car means that you are a part of an uh, of a of a of an elite class, and so it's it's not like a you know not always the things that come out of your necessity. And so um, driving a car often you know like uh, uh, belongs to another particular group of people uh, who are not at that class. So uh, so when you know the work is kind of like a tightly associated in this kind of a class identity, then it's very hard to you know like break that apart uh, with an app because what uh, what Uber is doing essentially is converting a uh, owner of the car as a as a driver. And for for me, you know, like here when you know, like the work is not associated with class and any uh, any other identity, it's easy. People are only seeing this as an opportunity to earn more. But in a place where you know what you do, uh, kind of like an. Uh, gives you an identity that people find it very difficult to live their you know like a already existing class identity and to take up a job or take up a work that you know like a force them in another class so so this kind of a you know like an, an understanding and assumptions were missing when this uh, this um, technology was was developed as we, we found there are many other uh, ways how we can see these differences another notable uh, problem notable difference that we found here was this kind of like a very individualistic model of uber it says that it's a it's a gig economy where it's a like a peer to peer network but if you look at how it works it essentially it does not you know like um, uh, rely on a longer term relationship between a driver and a passenger. So that a driver and a passenger on, only meets for a small amount of a time, and you be you be nice with them, and then you get a, like a five star, and that's that's all. But you know like uh, how the work is a structure, uh, you know historically in the global south is that you develop a 
long standing clientele with you know like the people that you were working with you were serving and you thrive on this relationship with the people who are you you know like uh, uh, who are you serving with your work and uh, when you take that here with uber then it becomes very difficult because this uber drivers in, in bangladesh they are on, on one hand uh, they, are, uh, they, they they need to maintain this long term relationship with the car owner and on the other hand this additional burden now they have is that they also have to maintain this small scale good relationship with the, with the passengers who are taking the rides so I say this kind of, uh, you know, like um, cultural assumptions are are different uh, from the assumptions that were made when this kind of uh, gig economy technologies were, were developed. And when it was, uh, you know, like these technologies were deployed in the global south, we are seeing that these problems are unfolding. Yeah, um, I did. Uh relationship part triggered something with me for for a future question but i'm gonna I have to write that down and not talk about it right away because one there was one more thing that i was really interested in in this paper because the, the one thing that you observed and, and found through the research is that the if i got it correct the car owners when they when they um sort of hire or work with with the drivers then the skill they were mostly interested in was how good are you with your smartphone? So the actual driving seemed to be less less important. So that was that was such a mind warp because I was like, if if I have a friend drive in my car, I I sort of want to know that they're an okay driver first. So it, it didn't fit my model what I would be looking for. But of course, I'm not in that situation. So can you can you tell us a bit more? Because you also tied it in with with de-skilling, right? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is this is actually a very important point. And I first observed this when I was uh, working with Microsoft Research as an intern in 2015 with Jackie O'Neill in India and then uh, the application called Ola, which is kind of like a similar to Uber, um, was new there, the drivers were uh, started using that. And what we found that, you know, like the, the old drivers were like experienced who knew uh, the city, uh, you know, like a lot, they were not getting a lot of rides. Instead, the you know, like the young ones who are you know, like a very good at you know, very fast at you know, like with their smartphones can click a button like a very quickly can swipe from one uh, you know <laughs> here to there. They were getting like a more calls and they were making more money and uh, you know, like the experienced driver they were getting frustrated. And we then asked this question, which we later explored further in our you know, like our recent work too, is what. What are the skills that are being appreciated when the work is, is you know, like uh, uh, being, you know, like a uh, mixed with these digital components here? So now it's obvious that the car owners they want to make more money, and for them they need drivers who can take, you know, like a lot of calls. Now, if now the question is, are they the, you know, like a safest drivers? Uh, do they, you know, like a uh, drive, uh, you know, like a uh, more comfortably and all those, you know, like uh, driving skills? Uh, do the car owners care about that a lot? No, if you, if you look at the contract models, if there is an accident, the driver is paying the cost. So why should they care, right? And uh, now, so now the, you know, like the, the work of driving, like what, how do we define driving and the skills of driving is not limited by, you know, like uh, how you actually drive the car. Now it has also incorporated this digital skills of how to find, uh, you know, like the passengers, how you, you know, how fast you can switch from one app to another and all these, you know, like a uh, digital things. And this actually connects this argument with kind of like a, a this, uh, Marxist argument of de-skilling. So, uh, you know, not going into this, you know, like a classical uh, Marxist discussion here, but there is this concern that when a new technology comes, the old skills become kind of like an irrelevant. And this is often the capitalist tendency and mechanism for, you know, like uh, diminishing the voice of the old and experienced workers, because they can then say that, well, you know, we have, we are experienced in this field and you need to hear about our demands. Otherwise, we are going to quit. So the union gets like um, stronger. But when you start replacing those skills by technologies and you start bringing new skills, you kind of 
devalue the experience of old workers and if this practice goes on then you know like uh, you know now they're valuing this uh, this you know like a uh, uh, expertise in using mobile phone applications maybe a few days later we'd be using virtual reality who knows but the the, the pattern that we are seeing is that the skills are shifting and this skills are shifting in a way that is not actually you know like a very much connected to the actual work of driving but it, the the control is not in the hand of the worker so who is controlling this is the, is the question so when this kind of like a de-skilling happens and you know like we come up with new strategies of re-skilling the drivers so that they can use this digital platform always this question happens like a lot of people are losing their jobs and new people are coming so the collective voice is missing so you know like when i was in bangalore there was also yeah you know like we saw a protest going on where the taxi drivers were actually coming to a conversation with the with the city with their demands and at the same time, you know, like, so who are leading this movement, the senior experienced drivers? And on the other hand, they are now facing this threat. So they're, they're going there and saying that, well, if you don't, you know, like uh, hear us, we are going to strike tomorrow. And on the other hand, city is saying that, well, if you even strike tomorrow, why do we care? You know, they, we have Ola and, you know, we don't actually need the experienced drivers. So here is where it's concerning. If we think about workers' voice, you know, like uh, which I'm, uh, uh, you know, like I, I care a lot about. It's uh, it's it's interesting that how this tendency of moving the skills uh, is actually diminishing workers' voice. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's um, concerning indeed how those those power relationships then then start to play, and I I, I think it really speaks to a wider issue, right? Of how, how automation changes a lot of our experiences in every country, right? And, and, and valuable skills. Uh, I mean, even here, you, you would want, I would want the experienced driver that really drives well, but, but I might not get that experienced driver due to that app. So that it, 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 yeah, mind warming what the, yeah. the issues here. Um, I want to make sure that we have sufficient time for questions from the audience. So if you're in the audience, again, feel free to, to write a question or just write, I have a question if you don't want to type it because it's an elaborate question. Um, but um, before we go to the uh, those questions, and I, I want to briefly touch on some of your other work because you've also looked in, in various countries, but I, I particularly came across the work again in, in Bangladesh on... Um, the impact that the COVID pandemic had, and you looked at the uh, repair and e-waste workers that I had heard also yeah. in, in another context uh, in the automotive sector about. Um, and this is the point where I thought before I had to put a pin in it because you were talking about the relationship building, how important that is, the customer relationship. And if I, I got the, the information from your paper correct, that was an important factor here as well, right? Because yeah. COVID happens, you're in lockdown, the customers can't come to your door. So how do you how do you maintain those relationships or benefit from them? So so can you tell us about your, your findings there? Absolutely. Yeah. So as you know, like uh, you know, with COVID, you know, we are now more dependent on digital technologies, you know, like schools are taking place on our computer, work is taking place on our computer. Now what, what happens when your, your computer and your mobile phone breaks down? Now you need to, uh, you know, like take it to a repair shop to fix it, but that, you know, if they are open, they're not safe. So, and, you know, like um, uh, in the in the earlier days of COVID, and I think there's a still a concern that even like uh, people do not want to touch other people's things because that may contain, you know, like a virus. Uh, and all these concerns are already there. So uh, now this tension uh, uh, was emerging that, you know, like uh, how are you going to fix your phones or your mobile phones if they're broken? And also it was impacting the job of this, you know, like a low paid mobile phone uh, workers. And uh, because a lot of their works are actually, you know, like a very much skill and craft driven. So it's not like, you know, you, you watch a video on YouTube and then you can fix your phones. It also involves how you, you know, like uh, how much you push all this, you know, like a tacit knowledge uh, sort of stuff. So now, you know, what we have been seeing in the, uh, in the, in the past one year or two during our study uh, that 
they're trying to help their clients over the phone or sometimes on over to Zoom that they are telling that, well, you do this and you do that. So they, they, are, they, they are also kind of like I'm working from home and they are kind of like trying to transfer the tacit knowledge through their kind of like an oral narrative of how you do that. And that is, we, we found that that is kind of like an eye opening for a lot of customers or a lot of people who have these broken devices. They are now realizing that it's not very easy because they are now trying that themselves. And on one hand, while we are seeing that this is, you know, like a, a point where the, you know, like the repairers are suffering financially, they are also, uh, you know, like she, they also shared with us that how they are also seeing this an opportunity for telling people how valuable their work is. Uh, and this is, you know, for to some of them, like they're saying that now people are seeing, uh, you know, like what we actually, you know, like a, due to the society and it reminds us to this you know like a uh, the infrastructure theory about uh, you know like a, uh you you understand an infrastructure when it breaks down uh so when covid broke it down now we can see where the repeaters are actually playing a vital role in sustaining the digital society that we live in yeah it's really uh really impactful right i, th I think in the us the digital technology is now part of that transportation bill. I don't want to start any politics, but I thought that is like <laughs> good that they detected that. Um, enough from me. I've seen questions in the audience. So, uh, Helena, um, I'll give the. Yeah, we do you. have a few. I'm really excited. Thanks so much for this really good talk. I'm going to call on Andrew Kuhn first, if you don't mind uh, unmuting yourself and asking your question out loud. Thank you. Mr. thank you for, for joining us. This was really fun. And, and so you were looking at this from the, the perspective of drivers. And I was also curious, some of the work we've done uh, recently was looking at, uh, you know, how might automated vehicles come into play when, when you're thinking about work and where you work and how you work. And, um, you know, in, in, let's say the U.S. is not very common for people to be driven anywhere. They usually drive, although that you're right, they do take Uber, let's say. But what is what is the situation, let's say, in Bangladesh or other countries you might be familiar with? How likely is it that if, I, if I'm a programmer or if I'm a middle manager or something along those lines that I continue, you know, constantly have a driver and I jump in the car, which is sort of like having an automated vehicle? Well, I guess like a... Uh... From Bangladesh context, it's, um, it's still hard to imagine this uh, driverless car moving in the street. And uh, uh, so there are like a two, so one part is like this whole, you know, like a technical difficulties that are there, you know, like, a, you know, like a, the, the, there's a challenge with the, with financial, you know, like a cost also, like the roads are different and, you know, like the traffic doesn't follow the rules, all these things. So that's like a, you know, let's put that as a technical challenge. Let's say like uh, somehow we overcome the technical challenge and driverless cars are in the field and we focus on what it means to the drivers or car owners who will be, will be doing this. And if we uh, imagine a scenario where the Uber company or like uh, companies like Uber, they are using this automated car uh, as providing like a service to the customers. I say that still there would be this, uh, this pushback from, uh, from, the, from the workers who were there in the transportation uh, authority or transportation company in general. What we are seeing in Bangladesh for, you know, like in this public transportation, um, they have a very strong union who have been pushing back um, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, like a devaluing uh, driver's voices. Um, so uh, I guess the, the the main problem that we'll be seeing there is uh, is, is the resistance from uh, from the drivers' unions who still do not, uh, you know, like uh, see this uh, automated, you know, like a vehicle scenario as something that's uh, that's going to help them anyways. Uh, and in fact, as, as I was telling, you know, there, 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 there was some kind of like a pushback even for introducing Uber and other applications that, uh, you know, they didn't take that um, you know, very, you know, very easily. It eventually, you know, like uh, became popular. Um, it's hard to tell now what will happen if autonomous cars uh, come to the picture. Thank you. That was really, uh, yeah, that was very much 
you know, insightful and necessary for us to understand that context. Um, uh, I'd like to call on Lydia Tomato now and ask her question. Okay, thanks, Selena. Hi, Ishtiak. Uh, awesome talk. I have so many questions and I find them hard to formulate because of the possibility of automation in the background. And I feel like this is almost making these questions moot, but I guess not because we still have some time. Um, and I really liked uh, Helena's question that she just added um, to the chat, but I, I guess I'm curious, and I think you've touched on it a couple of times, um, the, the way that drivers are connected to each other locally um, and I, I used to drive Lyft actually for about six months. So I have some like insight into um, like having like through Facebook connection with drivers and, um, you know, just learning from each other. So I'm kind of, I'm curious, I guess about, uh, I changed my question a little bit, I think about opportunities for, I mean, maybe potentially if there's any benefit to be had and maybe international collaboration between groups of drivers and, I don't know what the different power players are, like if Uber or Ola um, can be negotiated with like on a larger scale. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a, there's a great question. And this is something that we are also also thinking about, especially when we are, we're thinking about the voice of the, of the drivers. Um, as we, we saw even there like a, you know, like a Facebook groups that we are starting where the drivers are kind of like a, share their concerns uh, with each other. We have already seen the Uber drivers in Bangladesh, they have started to raise their uh, voice and sometimes they are in negotiation with, uh, uh, with the Uber, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, officials and uh, you know there comes this whole again like another layer of politics on social media because these groups are again being moderated by Uber uh, and it's funny that sometimes they even like a delete polls saying that you know that they are like too offensive and all this kind of stuff so so another layer of this but uh, but it's definitely an important uh, you know like question here is that what we can get from this kind of a solidarity, kind of like a global or, you know, like a, a broader, larger scale solidarity. And I think this is very important uh, today or tomorrow, these workers need to have, um, you know, like a strong position against, uh, you know, like this platforms like Uber or Lyft. Uh, Otherwise, it would be very hard to ensure what we call like a worker-centric environment. Now, what we see is that the trend is more uh, toward pleasing the car owners or the you know like the the passengers. But um, we are not hearing much from the drivers and what makes them happy. Uh, so you know like. Uh, uh, you know, as we, we saw, like it 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 it, it often like uh, was successful to you know like uh, draw more power and attention and you know like uh, uh, sometimes resources from other places. Um, it's it would be you know at least I believe that it will be it will be very useful to have kind of like a community like a united voice of all the people who are this kind of like a platform workers. Thank you for that. I think we only have really um, time for one more question. So I'm going to skip mine because I like to give the floor to others. And um, Simon Akhtar Jaffrin, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question because I think it was an important point you made. Hey, hi. Hi, everyone. This is Saima. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, so it's uh, to Mr. Tak uh, that Bangladesh is extremely overpopulated and Dhaka is extreme traffic prone. And it is like kind of like, uh, I can't say like the, the cars are not really moving. So the questions coming from the audience that, that like how can really we can really support this digitalization or automotive where this traffic is dysfunctional like this functioning the whole city like how are you seeing that what uh, how can we really uh, work on it or how automotive or digitalization can really help and um, the second question comes with the how the workers, uh, like you are saying that, like the connections between the drivers um, can really help in this uh, specific area. So yeah, that's my question. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ayman. That's that's really good question. And I was also like a, a trying to say before that if you look at this current traffic situation in Bangladesh, especially the big cities like in Dhaka and Chittagong, 
it's you know like uh, even with human drivers and all the you know like a force put in place it's it's the traffic is a big problem and uh you know, even with all the human drivers, it's, it's crazy. You uh, you cannot navigate through the city in a in a in a sane way, and I do not know how you know like the fully automatic you know automated vehicles would uh, would do this. But that's you know like a as a technical questions, and I know like uh, some of my you know like computer science colleagues they are coming up with new algorithms which might help in some ways in you know like uh, do these things and then keeping human in the loop and you know like we're seeing some progress uh, down the road. So that's that's you know there are um, you know like uh, some kind of optimism on that end, but I'm uh, actually more concerned about the resistance that this kind of initiatives are going to face from this strong uh, you know like uh, drivers. Uh, collective here uh, because Bangladesh and like many other South Asian country also has this like a rich history of uh, of uh, you know like uh, protests and you know like a uh, mass protest kind of a uh, thing like uh, against any kind of this uh, you know like a uh, any initiative that go against marginalized communities so um, I from that point of view at least I believe that it's uh, it will be difficult but on the other hand you know even if we think about uh, building that kind of a voice among the drivers. I think it's, uh, you know, on the digital platforms, these are very difficult to make that happen because uh, these drivers are not always located in a same place. Sometimes they are, you know, like they do not know each other. Uh, so Facebook is one platform that a lot of people are trying to uh, use for connecting uh, to each other, but uh, it's also being, you know, like, uh, uh, polluted by different kinds of other politics. The government is there, they are, you know, like they want to keep things calm. Then there is this layer of Uber who wants to make things like a pretty and nice on the surface. Um, as if like, you know, people are complaining and they're solving all these problems, kind of like, a, you know, suppressing the users, you know, like the drivers uh, grips and stuff. Uh, so it's, it's difficult from that end, and we're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, like uh, how to design a platform where we can, uh, unionize this the driver groups in a meaningful way so that they can you know like raise their voice and uh, you know like uh, make this kind of a protest more uh useful uh it's not saying that you know like a digitization or fully automation is not possible in bangladesh's situation but we don't want to want that happen uh, you know with the expense of a lot of you know like a drivers being uh, dissatisfied with it that's where I think, uh, you know, like a good deal of negotiation needs to take place. Yeah, thank you so much for answering my question. But I think you can do it on the Marine Drive of Cox's Bazaar. You can start from there because it's quite, uh, it's noise free. So we can start from there. Maybe some, this is Cox's Bazaar is the longest beach and the Marine Drive is really long. So also maybe it's possible in the, uh, like the, which are like connecting roads of Dhaka Chittagong or the highways, basically. So I think in that sector, like only only that portion might actually help without the traffic, because otherwise, uh, in other sectors, it's very hard. And without that, I would uh, I would suggest you for like bringing that to uh, to tunnel and other like metro metro rails. If you can really uh, focus on that, then maybe it could helpful. But maybe the normal um, roads might not really helpful in this. Like it will take a longer time, I think. <laughs> so I can't really think of it. I don't know when it will happen. So yeah, thank you for bringing it out. So thanks, thank you for answering my question. Absolutely, thanks for the question. Important problems with lots of ways to think about solutions right and not always trivial um there's lots more questions over the chat uh thanks uh helena for for doing a bit of moderation uh i want to round off <laughs> with the recorded part and then we'll we'll definitely have more time hopefully for for some questions uh, once the recording is off um, thank you again, uh, Ischak, for for your time and 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 explaining th these contexts and, and the implications. I think there's a lot to to learn also for other countries. There, there were a lot of things that resonated with me for for how the situation is here in the Netherlands. Even um, for uh, before we close the the recording, I uh, just want to point out that if you are on Twitter, uh, please join us there. Uh, that's at Kai Worksim. 
Um, next week, same time, we'll have Marius Konstantinidis from Nokia Bell Labs in Cambridge, and he will be hosted by Anna Cox. So we hope to see all of you there again. Uh, don't forget, if you want to subscribe, that you can do that through our website, www.kaiwork.org. And you can receive weekly updates so the invites automatically get into your inbox. That's really cool. Um, with that, thanks again, Ishtiak, and uh, we can stop the recording. <laughs>